never quiet. There should be action. There should be the human experience of, uh, uh, of what uh, healthcare is. You know, births, uh, lives saved, uh, families reacting. No one can replace a hospital that sees uh, 400 patients uh, a day. Where are those people going to go? What's going to happen to them? We have to move forward to get it uh, functional immediately. I, I brought in my luggage, I have three days' worth of clothes. I told my husband I'll be gone for three days. He said, okay, honey, kiss me goodbye. <laughs> I dispensed to the staff flashlights, lanterns. But I went around and I explained to each patient that we have a little storm brewing and that in the event that the light went out, that we would have the flashlights and the lanterns to keep them safe. But these patients are New Yorkers. So to them, oh, another hurricane, I'm inside, I'm safe. I was born in Haiti, and I, I know when a hurricane is coming, you can feel it, you can actually feel it. So I was mentally prepared for it. I've been at Bellevue now for 23 years. I started out here as a carpenter and I worked my way up and became the foreman. It's become our home here. We were here on standby from Sunday, preparing, moving stuff around, making sure windows were latched, the drains were clear. We sandbagged what doors we thought might get flooded. And basically just storm preparation, try to be prepared of what can and eventually did happen. The triage nurse called me over because the water had been going over the curb in the ambulance bay. And in a matter of seconds, the wind started howling. Even with the sandbags, the wind was so strong, it blew the doors open, and suddenly it was the ocean pouring into the emergency room. It was really the ocean. I turned on the flashlight, and immediately we started to move. Everybody was hands-on. It was everybody, from clerical to housekeeping, hospital police. We just grab a stretcher, get the next person, let's go. The water was up to my knees. It smelt like the ocean. There was sand on the floor. I have never experienced anything like that. All of a sudden, I heard all this noise, and I'm looking down a hallway with my flashlight, and all I could see was a caravan of stretches coming toward me, and they was holding their shoes in their hand. This was the ER staff.
we did what we had to do to keep the patients safe. experienced snowstorms, floods, transit strikes, uh, power outages, and we never experienced anything like this. I was in my office on the first floor. I gave everything a quick check. I looked out in the parking lot. At that point, the river was uh, where it belonged. As soon as we went outside, we were hit with the winds. You could feel the car kind of rocking, and you saw debris flying in the air. And then you started to see some flooded areas. Uh, that's when the uh, you know the, the the level of anxiety rose a bit. It literally looked like something out of a movie. It was a movie set. What do I do? You know, what else can I possibly do down here? And it was just at that point, it was that's when I realized we got to go. There's nothing else I could do down here. During the height of the storm, the windows were banging and like somebody was shaking them. So we had to take the patients out of the room and put them in the hallway. The staff as well as the patients were terrified. And I started hearing noises like water rushing in, but we didn't see any water. So I went over by the elevator shafts and you could hear the water cascading in through the basement into the elevator shafts. The East River was in the basement of the hospital. The whole lower east side of Manhattan started blacking out in increments, like dominoes falling one by one. And that's when we went to full generator power. There's so many devices here that are dependent on electrical power to maintain people's lives. The ventilators, pumps, dialysis machines, and if that power fails, all of these devices have a very short life of battery backup, but that's about it. The fuel to the generator was running out, and we only had an hour of fuel left. Once the fuel's out, that's it. The hospital goes black. No emergency power, nothing. We kind of smelled it before we even knew it. Is it gasoline? So I walk to our fire escape in our stairwell, and you see all this Bellevue staff all lined up, just bringing up the buckets of oil. 
every available employee that was there that night. Nurses, doctors, housekeepers, maintenance staff, everybody lined up in the stairwell. 13 stories, handing five-gallon pails of diesel fuel up the stairs, a human chain, the Bucket Brigade, as we called it, the Bellevue Bucket Brigade. Uh, I was proud to be of Bellevue, uh, a Bellevue staff at that time. We didn't have television, we didn't have radio, we didn't have internet, we didn't have, uh, telephones were very poor, so we didn't really know what was happening out there. I mean, everybody knew everything about us, but us. A well, hospital can't function without water. So you can't wash your hands, you can't bathe your patients, let alone the conditions in our restrooms when you have several thousand staff members here without functioning toilets. We could get by without electricity if we have to. I can put a nurse beside every patient who needed to be watched, but we couldn't get by without water. Conditions in this hospital deteriorated very quickly once water was lost. Bellevue is the oldest continuously opening hospital in the U.S. Bellevue's been through an enormous amount. The AIDS epidemic, multiple blackouts that we've had, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. No previous event had ever closed Bellevue to anything. Bellevue has always kind of served as a sanctuary during these crises, during natural disasters, terrorist attacks, anything that happens. Bellevue is always supposed to be a safe place. So I was told to start from the 17th floor down and make my way down, and that's what I did. Of course, the elevator were, were not working because we had a flood in the basement, and it was dark. And we had to do it one by one by one, so every single patient that was left here, we had to take them one by one by one to the waiting ambulances. So we started moving out the ICU patients very shortly after the hospital lost water. And uh, starting with the patients that were most acutely ill, uh, we just started finding a way to actually physically carry them down the stairs. I was afraid how the patient was going to act when we went down the steps because some of them were terrified. So after the National Guard arrived with many, many more troops, several hundred, the pace of the evacuation dramatically increased. And so I know over one eight-hour period, there were over 200 patients evacuated from this hospital with the help of the National Guard. The last ICU patient left Wednesday evening, probably around 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening. Everybody just erupted in cheering, crying, <laughs> uh, hugs. And I think nobody felt any pain until we moved the last patient out. That's when you sat down and you said, well, I can't move my legs anymore. Everybody just felt this amazingly profound sense of relief that everybody was out and everybody had gotten out safely. Walking through the basement, everything has been removed from the hallways. A lot, if not all, the familiar landmarks that were there for years that you're just walking, you don't even think about it. You go, okay, I'm turning here, I'm going there. I got down there and I'm looking around, I'm going, all right, where am I now? the magnitude of the piles of debris, the stuff being thrown away, brand new equipment, brand new furniture. There's no way to clean it, no way to sterilize it. And we're not doing what we'd like to do. 
we like to take care of patients and we're not able to do that now. willingly and enthusiastically went everywhere. They're in Woodhull Hospital, they're in Metropolitan, they're in Lincoln, they're in Kings County, uh, they're in Harlem Hospital, uh, they're everywhere. They're in Lenox Hill, they're in New York Presbyterian, they're in Columbia, um, and they went there because the uh, load on the city was enormous. After the remediation and demolition were done, now the rebuilding starts. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, carpenters, electricians, masons, cleanup crews. It's just, it's a nonstop rebuilding process. It's like they're breathing life back into the beast. You know, the future disasters will come, and they'll be different than those today, but studying everything we've done during these days, before, during, and after, will allow us to do better for human beings in the future. We always come together when we are times of crisis, challenges. We always do. But this time around, it was even, even more. I'm getting all messages and emails from my nurses saying they want to come home. They really want to come home. <laughs>